It's alive! It's alive! Hey everybody! Yes, I am back. After, I think, a two and a half month break, I am here, ready to be back in the saddle. The first month of that was basically me doing kind of an internet ban on myself, which went really well. And then I came back, tried to make a couple of videos, and they just went terribly. So I was like, I'll put it off for another week. I'll put it off for another week. I tried to make videos. They were all horrible. Pretty sure I kind of forgot how to do this and whether I wanted to do it anymore. And then something just kind of snapped into place today, and I felt great. I was like, I'm going to film a video. So I'm going to cross my fingers today, and hopefully I can finally get this done. I've tried to record this specific video three times now. Um, it's a big one, which kind of goes against everything I thought I was going to do while I was gone. During my absence, I was kind of promising myself that I was going to come back and make shorter, more digestible videos for people because I know how hard it is to take so much time out of your day to watch 15-minute videos from a couple of people. However many people are on your subscription list, I'm sure it's a lot more than a couple. Um, I know how hard that can be, so I wanted to kind of make shorter, easier to watch videos for people. And then I read Gone with the Wind, a 960-page epic about the Civil War and survival and whiteness and one of the most charmingly insufferable main characters that's ever been put to paper. This book also essentially created the template for YA literature, which maybe sounds weird, but just stick with me on this one. It'll make sense by the time this video is done. So I will apologize in advance for how long I think this video is going to be, but I just think this is too important a book to gloss over. In short, this is a beautiful, complicated, sprawling epic that is just as much about class as it is about race, but yeah, it, it's 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 really about race. Like, God, is it ever about race. But maybe not in exactly the way Margaret Mitchell intended. I absolutely love this book. So Gone with the Wind is the latest book that I'm talking about in my top 125 books of all time project. If you want to know more about the project and about the list of the books, I will put a link to that in the description below of the six best books lists that I use to compile my list of the top 125 books. Gone with the Wind only appeared on two of them. On the one hand, this makes no sense at all to me. This is such a an amazingly crafted, important book, a true monument to a very specific, very important time in history. But on the other hand, I totally get it. Like, a lot of this book is uncomfortable, to say the least. If you haven't read Gone with the Wind, I guess you shed out a lot because I'm not going to summarize it for you here. For one thing, the book is almost 100 years old, and for another thing, the book is almost a thousand pages long, so summarizing that kind of takes forever. It was one of the big issues I had trying to make this video in the first place. By the time I got to the end of the summary, my video was like nine and a half minutes long, and I was just like, screw it. I can't. I can't. Like, if you if you don't know what Gone with the Wind is about, how, um, and and if you are interested in finding out, Google it. Essentially, it's an American Civil War story told from the perspective of the losing side through the eyes of a young, privileged heroine named Scarlett O'Hara. She spends much of the book embroiled in a love triangle between quiet, clean-cut Ashley Wilkes and scandalous, dashing rogue Rhett Butler. So that was an extremely simple setup for a very long book with a lot of complications, but that's basically all you need to know for the rest of this video to make any kind of sense. And if you still feel like you need to know more about the book, I would stop watching this video right now because I'm about to spoil the shit out of everything. The complications I just spoke of around this book um, arise from the fact that it is written about the South in 1861. Characters talk like that, characters act like that, and Margaret Mitchell, despite writing the book in the mid-1930s, really idolized the antebellum South and everything that it stood for. So the question then becomes, how did this book not only survive until now, but how has it thrived until now? Like, next to the Bible, this is one of the best-selling books of all time. 
like to this day. So today in 2019, what does Gone with the Wind offer us? And to me, the answer is an incredible example of construction, deconstruction, and then reconstruction. I have heard so many stories over the years, and I've read a lot of Goodreads reviews recently about people discovering Gone with the Wind for the first time as a young person. And I can only imagine on that first youthful reading, that kind of combination of love and lust and doubt and adventure and like will they won't they the construction of this kind of idealized version of the south and of a life that is literally torn away from this strong young woman as the union soldiers literally raise atlanta to the ground until this woman basically pulls herself up by her bootstraps and rebuilds her life so this book holds a lot for our younger selves, those people who were just realizing that they're separate from the rest of the world and that lots of things are going to happen to us that are outside of our control and seem unfair. But as you grow older, maybe if you read the book again, maybe you're a little wiser, the book also offers a great chance at deconstruction. This is not an ideal setting. This is not an ideal culture. These aren't ideal people, despite what Scarlett might think. During this deconstruction phase, we're able to see that Margaret Mitchell tilts the story, tilts the focus of the story towards Scarlet constantly in this way that every slave character in the book doesn't get a chance to become part of the narrative, to have their own voice, to tell their story. Essentially, they're not given the same chance to have like an equivalent humanity to Scarlet. There is certainly room for a person to pick this book up at some point during their reader's journey and have an extremely negative reaction to it, like really, really strongly feel this book is awful and terrible and no one should read it. Because objectively, there is a lot to not like about Gone with the Wind. In an effort to simplify that, let's just talk about Scarlet. She is a fucking moron. She is often selfish. She is shrill. She is skin deep. She's passive. She's vindictive. She is so petty. She steals another woman's husband twice. And obviously she's so racist, but everyone is racist. However, because the book is just so well told, it just sticks in our brains. It just like percolates in there and just won't let go. And we come to realize that just because the book has a lot of bad, that doesn't mean that it also doesn't hold a lot of good. And living in that gray area is okay. Like, at least in this instance, because this book is truly a monument to a different time and place. And because of it, we're able to look back on it and understand and see things and grow and learn from it. We have the gift of hindsight in this case. We're able to look back and judge it as it should have been judged at the time. And this is where the third and most important step happens, reconstruction. This book is a product of North American mythology. And by that, I mean, in America, myths can become true because people want them to be true. And in this way, all of white North America is complicit. Every single one of us is Scarlett O'Hara. Some of us are Scarlett at her richest and most viciously powerful, and some of us are post-war Scarlett, who is taking stock of her privilege, still blind to the fact that her success is still predicated on plunder and the fact that the world still favors white people in every respect. But the tricky thing about the book, and the reason why I think a lot of people have tried to ban the book in the same way that people are trying to tear down Confederate monuments, is that the book doesn't do the work for you. Margaret Mitchell did not think the way that we think now. Her morality is 85 years old, and she was old-fashioned even then. But that isn't to say that the building blocks for growth aren't here. You have to kind of internalize the text and make your own conclusions. Ultimately, I think that's the most rewarding kind of reading experience, and that's why I really, really love the book. But that's the riskiest way to tell a story because 
as we've seen, a lot of people don't realize that Margaret Mitchell wrote Scarlett O'Hara as an unreliable narrator. I don't even think Margaret Mitchell was aware that Scarlett O'Hara was an unreliable narrator. And as a result, she has charmed millions of people toward her way of thinking. Like, it's still happening. Millions of people are still reading this book and thinking like, that's Scarlett, she's got some good ideas. Look, most people, and let me be clear, I am absolutely included in this group of people. Most people don't realize how much luck was involved with them succeeding over their trials and tribulations. Thanks to unearned privileges. Like, so many doors were open for me that weren't open for other people because I am white, because I am not disabled, because I'm not trans. I live in a beautiful house and I have a pretty good job and it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking like, I got an education and I worked hard just like Scarlett worked hard and that's why I have what I have. It's so easy to feel like that. And then I witness Scarlett's ignorance and then I realize how many shoulders that I had to stand on to get to where I am right now. And this is the part of the video where I start to dump on Scarlett a little bit. So for any of you Scarlett heads out there, I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry because Jesus, she had it coming. Scarlett O'Hara's story begins when she's 16 and ends when she's 28. In that amount of time, she survives a war where a lot of her loved ones die. She marries two men, she has three children, and she goes from being kind of a naive youth to being a fairly shrewd businesswoman. Scarlett has many, many good qualities. I'll just say that off the top. But she's got so many bad ones. Like she's one of these women who only notice men and she just, she doesn't even realize how good of a friend Melanie was the entire time and how much she really needed her throughout this whole story, essentially until it's too late. And I will say this, and at me if you want, because I'm no stranger to controversy these days. Scarlett O'Hara is not a feminist. She may be a feminist icon, someone that feminists can look towards and feel empowered by, but she is not a feminist. She doesn't care whether women get to vote or not. She doesn't care about women as a group at all. She only cares about herself and her family. She has no political conscience, like at all. She's a survivalist. That's what she is. That's very, very different than being a feminist. She's strong. So she has a feminist quality, for sure, but is she a feminist person? I don't think so, at all. Yet I've met so many, especially white feminists in my life, who just kind of can't get past that initial rush of reading Gone with the Wind and just thinking like, what a trailblazer Margaret Mitchell was, and I'm sure she was in a lot of ways, but this kind of like, Scarlet is, is hashtag goals kind of way that I just, I just don't have time for. Like the O'Hara's are just the blueprint for the temporarily disenfranchised millionaire family in America. They may be dirt poor at the time, but they're still better than you because how they were born and where they were born and what they were born into. Gone with the Wind sells like this white bootstrapper myth so well. It's why I think it's it's caught on with so many people, but it also sells the concept of the happy slave at the same time. So take everything that Mitchell is saying with a grain of salt, please. Like, the novel ends when she's 28 years old. She's estranged to her second husband and the, is the extremely negligent mother to three children, one of whom is dead. She has not grown up. She's not learned from any of her mistakes. She's still a spoiled brat, and she's insisting that she will always get what she wants. That's literally the final lines of the book is her determined to get what she wants because she's lived a life where that has always been the case. It takes real work, I think, as a white person to realize just how deep your privilege goes and how steeped in racism you've been your entire life. It takes reading books like Gone with the Wind. It takes reading books like Gone with the Wind two or three times which I've done in the last month and a half. I read the, I've read the book twice in the last month and a half. It takes real emotional and societal literacy to realize that most of your life, if you're a white person, has been fiction. Your history is fiction. Your books are fiction. Your education has been fiction. Your version of who you are is probably a little bit fictitious. 
That being said, everyone in this book is racist. It's hilarious. Like both white people and black people. And what interested me maybe the most in reading this book is how much these relationships seem to be about class. At least a little more than they are about race. Like Scarlett and her family hate lower class white people way more than they hate black people. And the black people in the story have very clear and distinct class lines even amongst themselves. Like take for instance Pork who is the O'Hara's butler. He looks down on um, lower class white people the same that Scarlett does and he even looks down on lower class black people probably even worse than she does. Like during the war when Scarlett is left with only a few loyal slaves um, she needs to start tilling her own land in order to survive and she asks Pork to help her work the fields with her. And he says no. He says that plowing is a field hand's work and he's never been a field hand and he refuses. And let's be clear, this is a time when if they don't farm, they will starve and they will die. And he still refuses. It was just such an interesting dynamic. I just, I didn't expect that and I thought that was, uh, that was kind of fascinating to see. But who knows if it's right. I, I will say that, that's the caveat. It's Margaret Mitchell's telling this story it's extremely biased in one direction. Maybe she's trying to just point out the fact that everyone's racist and any racism coming out of white people is just the version that comes out of white people. Like, now that I say it out loud, that's probably what it is. In the end, the most beautiful thing about Gone with the Wind for me was how I wasn't biased towards any of the subject matter. Everything about Scarlet on paper sounds like I would hate her. The Confederates should be appalling. Even the love triangle between Scarlett and Rhett and Ashley has so many ups and downs that I was, there was times when I just, it took all of my energy not to just scream at the book that I was holding just because everyone who's in love in this book acts like such a moron all the time. They are so stupid. But I loved it. Like, I love this book so much. Five stars, absolutely. If it's not the best book that I read in 2019, I will be shocked. All because of Margaret Mitchell's storytelling. She has this ability to just put you in the middle of something that should make you uncomfortable and yet it's not too uncomfortable and it's never boring. She is so charming, it's ridiculous. I just spent the last 10 minutes just eviscerating Scarlett's character and yet I spent the last a thousand pages alongside her and I loved every single minute of it. Every single, there's not a, a single lull in this 960 page book. It's that good. Despite the fact that she thinks in almost every way that I don't, Scarlett just has a charm to her that you just can't avoid. She's just tons of fun to read. To this day, I just, I don't get how Margaret Mitchell did that. It's, it's one of the most impressive feats of writing I've ever seen. And I don't, I think she was even surprised by it because I remember reading um, an interview with her and she was saying that before the book came out, she thought she was the only person in the world who would actually like Scarlet. And it turns out pretty much everybody does. At almost no point does this book go where I thought it was going to go. Even the love triangle, like even by today's standards, I thought was incredibly subversive. Even the war, which obviously is a foregone conclusion, it was just fascinating to see the, the reformation that happened afterwards, as gruesome as it was. It's just, it's just interesting to see people forced to take on a different way of life than they're used to or they want to, and they just have to meander their way through that. I just love that this story was, was a story of people on the losing side of a war. I don't know how many times that story's really been told. Where like they lose and at the end of the book they still lose. It's not like they lose at the start and then they, they have their comeuppance and then they win in the end. Like, no, they lose start to finish, they get thumped. How often do you see that? It's It was just, it's so compelling. So yeah, Gone with the Wind is just, it's extraordinary. It's a 10 star book. Like, it's so good that this top 125 books project that I'm doing will feel worthwhile just because I read this book, because I never would have read Gone with the Wind in the rest of my life. I never would have thought of reading this book, but I did. So 
at the very least, for this project, I'm thankful that, uh, that I got to read Gone with the Wind. And speaking of that project, the next book that I'm going to be tackling is going to be 1984 by George Orwell, which I've actually read already. Uh, and without spoiling too much of it, let's just say, like... <laughs> As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being patient while I was away for two and a half months uh, just dealing with some stuff. But I am back, and hopefully I'm here to stay uh, without another break. Please, if you've read Gone with the Wind, let me know what you thought of it below. If you thought any of my takes were way off base, uh, please let me know. Hopefully I didn't offend anybody <laughs> this time. And I will say, I must clarify that... Um, my absence had nothing to do uh, with some of the stuff that had gone on uh, with my last video. I had some pretty contentious conversations with a couple of people. Um, and in no way was that a reason why I was I was staying away. I actually thought it was really great that that happened. I'd had some really good conversations with people. Um, and it really kind of opened my eyes to a few things. And um, yeah, I certainly didn't intend to offend anybody. But I did in a, <laughs> in a big way. Um, so I learned a lot. So everyone who reached out and... Um, had some nice kind of civil or not so civil conversations with me. Thank you so much. That was that was a, a really important experience for me. So uh, so yeah, thanks to everybody for uh, for watching that last video and again sticking around obviously to watch this one. Oh, uh, before I forget, I totally forgot to talk about that YA thing. Okay, I basically I think that Gone with the Wind formulated the template for YA literature. I don't I don't think it, I don't know if it actually did. I don't know if there's like studies that have been done or uh, critical reviews or connections made. I have no idea. But when I was reading it, I was like, this is the first, this is the oldest book I've ever read that clearly lays out some of the tropes, a lot of the tropes that you see in almost every YA book ever written. Like, okay, get this. Let's just start with the setup. Scarlett O'Hara is a 16-year-old girl caught between two warring cultures and she's ready to go on like the greatest adventure of her life if that's not a setup for every YA book ever made I don't know what is and at the same time it checks all of the YA heroine boxes Scarlet isn't very beautiful except that she obviously is she's caught between uh, these two love interests both of whom are extremely attractive but in very different ways and appeal to both sides of her nature kind of the good and the bad. She is set against just like insurmountable odds, but is given powers and privileges to help her overcome that. And she does. She ends up being like astonishingly competent at skills that no one taught her. Like in this book, she's very gifted at mathematics. She ends up being a very, very uh, skilled businesswoman out of nowhere. She shoots a trained soldier in the face with a gun. Like, what? And parents have, like, almost no bearing on anything in this story. In true YA fashion, everything falls on her, a teenager, and she comes out on top. Like, Scarlett O'Hara is Katniss Everdeen, but, like, in a hoop skirt. 